OK, thank you. So let's get started. Additionally, I would want to indicate to you that at the end of the workshop, we will be inviting you to make a quick evaluation, very simple, very short, just to get your feedback, which is very valuable for us. So let's get into the subject matter here. You are enjoying a web seminar offered by the Kruplas Academy. This is a virtual series for capacity building that is intends to provide information and share knowledge about the project or from the GEF Crew Plus project on the integrated solutions for water resources and water and sanitation in the Great Caribbean region. So if we are ready, now I'm going to briefly introduce the stars of our show today, all of them experts in their fields. We have today Dr. Osvaldo Jordan, who is the Executive uh, Director of the Ramsar Regional Center, then Master in Science Andres Farais, Technical Officer of Wetlands International, and Master in Engineer Hugo Francisco Parratabla, who is the Deputy Manager of Sector Programs on Water Quality, and he is in charge of Water Quality Management of Conagua in Mexico. That's the National Water Commission. Next, allow me to guide you through the agenda of the web seminar today. In case you cannot see me, I'm over there as your moderator. And first of all, we are going to have a brief introduction from me to kind of give you the context for this webinar, followed by the presentations by our experts, Osvaldo from the Ramsar Center, who will talk about ecosystem services of wetlands and the relationship with the water and sanitation sector. Engineer Fries is also going to talk about practical cases using aquatic bioindicators to determine water quality. And finally, Engineer Parra will talk to us about the standards for wetland ecosystems for water quality, the Mexican official norm for karstic systems. So after each presentation, we're going to have a brief space like for very specific clarifications, just about five minutes. And at the end of all the presentations, we are going to have a plenary where we would be getting your comments, your observations and your questions to generate an interactive space. Next, time to introduce this topic. I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we are focusing our discussion today. Within the framework of our project, the idea is to get to an integrated approach for water management. This approach is traditionally based, it's a territorial approach that we can visualize through integrated water resources uh, management. You see some landscape over there. I think that this is in the border between Guatemala and El Salvador, the Rio Paz, the Paz River. You have the basin going down. We talk about these approaches from uh, the range to the ocean. It's, a, I'd say, a landscape approach. Then we also have in water management world what I would call a more structured approach where we have water, sanitation and health, the infrastructure, the provision and all that, uh, th those elements that are related to this. But there is a topic that is sometimes left aside and this is where we talk about the ecosystems. Where is the ecosystem approach? And in this case, it's represented by the emblematic ecosystem of water, that's the wetlands. So we are going to look for those relationships, those interrelationships with all these approaches to see what is the it in the practice. Another way of envisioning this connection is through the sustainable development goals. I have here a visualization that I've always liked that it's called the wedding cake. This was developed by the Estocolm Resilience Center. And what it tries to connect is all these different layers where we have the different SDGs. You will see 
in the bottom cake, which is the biosphere, this is where we have our sustainable development goal for water and sanitation number six. It is to the right, it's very small, but it's over there. But additionally, we also have those for sea life and life on Earth, which is where we have uh, biological diversity, other natural resources, and hence ecosystems. So what we mean by all this is that there is a direct connection between water management and those ecosystems that maintain water and the biodiversity. So how do we do for this basis of the wedding cake to support society and to support economy in a sustainable development approach. So we're going to exemplify that in the presentations today through what I call supportive elements for integration that may include multilateral agreements, state policies, national regulations, and also the implementation in the field. So we are going to continue with our first presentation from the experts. And I'm going to introduce him at this moment. Osvaldo, are you there? Yes, good morning. Oh, thank you, thank you, Osvaldo. I'm going to give you the floor in a second. Dr. Osvaldo Jordan Ramos completed his studies in biological sciences in the State University of California. He has a master's in Latin American studies and a PhD in political sciences from Florida Gainesville University. He has taught courses in different universities and he has worked as a researcher, a project manager and consultant in different government organizations and international organizations focusing in the formulation of public policies for the management of protected areas, climate change adaptation, community engagement, and reduction of vulnerability from the perspective of the human rights. He is currently the executive director of the regional center Ramsar for the Western Hemisphere located in Panama. It is an international organization devoted to the research and training on wetlands in over 30 countries of the Americas. So, I give the floor to Osvaldo and I will be guiding through the presentation. Welcome Osvaldo and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much Julio and it's uh, great to greet all the participants. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk about a topic that well, we have realized is very interesting for all the countries of the Americas and it is the relationship between wetland management and water and sanitation policies. So we can move to the next slide now. As an introduction, I just wanted to tell you about the Convention for the Protection of Internationally Important uh, Wetlands, the Ramsar Convention, that now is a very important topic. This designation of this, the Ramsar, the transporter cooperation, but very importantly, the rational use. I think that these initiatives of water and sanitation fit in this field of rational use. With regards to the designation of the Ramsar sites, nowadays we have, next slide, okay there, we have more than 2,416 Ramsar sites that are designated, the area already goes over uh, the size of the state of Mexico, so it is an important area of wetlands worldwide, so to talk about these, creo, Creo is one of four training centers associated to the Ramsar Convention that exist at the global level. First, Creo is in Puma, the Americas, but there is also the Ramsar Center in the east of Africa. There is a center also in the center and west of Asia and also the Korean Center covering the eastern part of Asia. Our main mission is a training to the right, you can see some of the manuals we have. I'm going to refer to water management specifically, but they serve as the basis for the work we do with the public officials, but also with the civil society and with the general public. Next slide. I wanted to talk about 
the topic of nature-based solutions, which is a term that we are listening about very frequently. And whenever there is a term that becomes, you know, kind of important at the international level, it's worth trying to analyze its origin. And a key point here, a key point here is, okay, they, they're having a little issue in, the Spanish channel with the presentation, but Osvaldo is going to continue with the presentation. So what I was saying is that the evaluation of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was a very important that we gave emphasis to the environmental services. Then, as Julio was saying, we have the Paris Agreement, then the launching of sustainable development goals and how to relate those environmental services with the accomplishment of those objectives, including, of course, water and sanitation. From this discussion that has about six, seven years since it started, we generated the concept of nature-based solutions. So. At the beginning, a lot of emphasis was uh, made into everything that was related to climate change, adaptation and mitigation. However, there is really a very general concept that allows us to approach different topics that have to do with the solution of human. So in the particular case we're working with, we have the nature-based solutions that can also be approached for everything that has to do, as I said, with water and sanitation. There is very interesting work from Cohen, UIC, uh, UCN 2016, and then this paper from La Forteza 2017, where they talk about urban resilience, sustainable urbanization, restoration of degraded ecosystems, climate change adaptation and mitigation, environmental risk reduction, and, and everything is related to the work we can do with the management of wastewaters. Next slide. And just for future reference, you can see a UCN 2016. Next slide. This is the paper from La Forteza. And then focusing more specific on the next slide, we focus on the topic of wastewater treatment. And there is an interesting topic here. The wastewater plants and in general wastewater management is closely related geographically with the wetlands. So I think there are two directions, two ways. One, that they become a problem and threaten the ecological integrity of the wetlands. And another one, that they can be mixed and collaborate with wastewater management, with wetland management. We're going to see here that basically we talk about what we call constructed wetlands. That's the concept that has been used. But I say that that concept has to be taken kind of carefully because up to which point the wetland is constructed and up to which point it is actually a modification or a potential rational use of an existing wetland. In the next slide, we basically see or analyze the situation of Latin America because unfortunately, this is not the region where the combination, the combination of wetlands uh, management is, uh, uh, and uh, wastewater management is combined. Just in about 0.22% of the flow of uh, wastewater in Latin America would go to what we call constructed wetlands or some kind of facility. There's a lot of technical details that I couldn't explain about how to accomplish that these uh, wastewater get to different points and be treated with engineering work that is relatively friendly with the wetlands. But what I want to emphasize is that unfortunately, our schools have not been prepared for professionals in environmental engineer and civil engineer to know how to use these uh, techniques. And we have a big challenge for the region here. From the Ramsar Convention, I can say that the guidelines that have been developed for wastewater and wetland management are 
still kind of early in an early stage. Curiously, a lot of the knowledge is coming from Europe, North America, and Asia. And I'm sure that in the next uh, conference of the parties in Wuhan in China, that is going to be a more important uh, topic. Then, going back to the presentation, I was mentioning about the water ma manual, the water management manual and the importance of wastewater, especially when we talk about the artificial wetlands, which are recognized as wetlands by the Ramsar Convention, but always emphasizing that this sense of artificial is relative if the wetland, because it could be a treatment area, reproduces ecological conditions that allow to maintain the functions and the environmental services, then we can say that they, this is performing a key ecological role, no matter if there is an important engineering work. There is also a publication in the year 2002, if I'm not wrong, about the economy of wetlands. And in this case, we see the case of Mabikubo in Uganda, and that is basically a wetland that's located between the Vic Lake Victoria that's downstream in the Kampala city, and that among the services, the fundamental environmental services, uh, performs the purification of water. It has direct uh, use, but the purification of water actually becomes a very, very important point as an environmental service for wetland, this wetland. So you can take a look at that document, and then in the last uh, conference of the parties that was in Dubai, there is also a resolution of urban wetlands climate change, emphasizing the need for the group of specialists, the scientific and technical group, to approach everything that is related to wastewater management, and that is related to some technical uh, some inputs that the commission has been produced in the last years, and that's very valuable. For example, the manual for the integration of urban development to wetland management. Once again, a lot of experience that is developed in the Asian countries and also in Europe, but the Asian countries have a lot to provide in that line at this moment. And there is a program from the convention, which is the one for the accreditation of wetland cities. And once again, most of the cities credited are cities from Asia, China, Korea, and other countries. And also in Europe, there is a relevant experience. And those cities, in a way, give us an idea of how we can accomplish this integration between wastewater and wetland management. We do not know the result of the call that should be presented this year. We don't know we're going to have the first uh, city credited as wetland city for um, the Americas. Right from Ramsar, we can tell you that this topic became very important, and we are listening from the different countries of the Americas about the concerns related to wetland management and wastewater treatment. In the <laughs> we have the main plant located in the Ramsar site in the Panama Bay, but we also think that from Costa Rica, from Peru, from many other countries, we can have lessons learned that can be very important for us to understand how to change the course of what we have been doing so far. So far, there has been a divorce between wastewater management with classical engineering works and wetland management as if they were two separate words. I think that the Ramsar Convention offers some light to have a more integrated management and probably more success with this nature-based solution approach. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Osvaldo. Let me just take five minutes here to see if there is any punctual question or clarification you want Osvaldo to make, you can open your microphone or write your question in the chat.
I also want to ask if there is any question in the English channel so that they transfer it to this other side. I have a, there's a question here. Uh, and please say your name, okay? When you ask the question, Zacarias from Dominican Republic. The systems that are constructed for wastewater, they're small systems. Uh, and usually the natural wetlands are big. There is another, sorry, there's another microphone that has been on. I'm sorry, all the participants, please mute your microphones if you're not participating. And Zacarias, please go on. Okay, and I was saying mainly small countries, the small cities, they may have secondary systems with uh, wetlands. But I imagine that for Ramsar, they would not work uh, as a small sites. However, there is a possibility that several wetlands in the same territory, let's say several constructed wetlands in the same territory can be considered as a single one if they generate some kind of contribution. Well, yes, thank you for the question. And greetings, Zacarias, and greetings to all the friends in the Dominican Republic. Yes, we should remember that in the Ramsar concept, there is a core area, usually a protected area, but there is a buffer area that could even be greater than the core area where we have to practice what we know as rational use. So in this conglomerate, the existence of treatment areas well uh, managed with a, a good technology is not incompatible with a Ramsar site. It is even more complex in the existing Ramsar sites where there is some pressure and the possibility that one of the measurements to be able to restore the water flows and to improve the environmental conditions is the location or the placement of a treatment plant. This is something that has to be analyzed very carefully according to the national regulations, but also taking into account the Ramsar guidelines. What's more important for Ramsar is to maintain the ecological characteristics. If the treatment plant is built and eliminates the existence of a species like fish, insects, or birds, if that plant doesn't have a benefit for the local population, then it does not qualify according to the Ramsar criteria. But if, as has been done in other countries, there is a level of amenity or coexistence with a landscape area or an area of conservation for migrating birds, that doesn't have to be incompatible with the designation. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. We have a question in the chat. We will copy the link of this uh, manual he has mentioned. And if there is any other question on the microphone, Okay, so we are now going to then go on with the next presentation. We will be copying the link requested. I think there is a hand raised. Jenny Peña. Yes, uh, Jenny, please open the microphone and we will listen to your question, Jenny. I don't see any hand. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Jordan. I hope you can be with us for the plenary in a while. And next, we are going to go to the presentation by engineer Andres Freis. Andres, do you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. I'm going to introduce you in a second. Okay, Andres Freis is a biologist by the State University of Campinas, and he has a, a degree in 
engineering in Brazil. He has more than 15 years of experience in coast uh, coastal management with restoration of coast ecosystems, coast erosion, aquaculture, and fishing in projects in Panama, Brazil, and Colombia. He has worked both at the university level and the government level and with international organizations. And he is currently a technical official in the Wetlands International Foundation based in Panama. So Andres, I can see you. So you tell me how to move on with your presentation. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this beautiful event and to be able to share with you the experiences, Julio, I cannot see the presentation, so I don't know if I have any issue with my equipment here to be able to see it. Can, the, can any of the other participants tell me if you can see it? Yeah, we can see the presentation. I don't know, Andres, if perhaps you have. Yeah, we can see it here. No, I, ju I just get a blank screen. Somebody else just having a blank screen. In the, Eng in the English channel, we are able to see the right screen. Okay, we are on the cover page with the picture of the Juan Diaz River from Panama. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this event. As I have said, I'm going to tell you about some practical cases about the use of bioindicators with uh, water ecosystems, wetlands, in uh, different uh, areas, including sanitation. Let's move to next slide, okay. First of all, for those that do not know us, the Foundation Wetlands International, we are an international organization working exclusively with the wetlands. We are in over 20 countries distributed throughout the continents of the world. And next slide. This uh, next slide, if I'm not wrong, is bioindicators. Okay, we have the bioindicators. To talk about the practical cases, well, first of all, what are the bioindicators? The bioindicators are organisms that indicate to us, in a way, the conditions of the environment, if there has been any modification, if there has been the intervention of some kind of contaminant that has affected us, and it, that can also indicate the health of the ecosystem as such. So the bioindicators are living organisms, and these living organisms that we use to find about the quality of the environment if there is the intervention of any contaminant or if something has happened in the condition of an ecosystem that has been affected by any condition. At the same time, the bioindicators can determine what ecosystems we are observing, what type of habitat we're getting into. So the next line. This is the first uh, case we see. It's the case of the Las Lajas uh, Lake. That lake is a restoration of mangrove, but it is important to see the detail that when we identify the sign, it was registered as a swamp, not as a mangrove. And that registry was in the Geographical Institute Tommy Guardia, which is where we have the geographical information of Panama. So for us to determine 
uh, that that ecosystem was a mangrove uh, that had been lost uh, through time. There is another topic or, or another reasons why the mangrove was lost, but what I want to get to is really to the use of the bio indicators here, the indicators that helped us determine what type of ecosystem we were observing, if it was really a swamp or if it was a mangrove ecosystem. So if we go to the next slides there, these other slides will come up. The first one is some logs. No, the, the, the last one. First, okay, yes, the logs and then the fish. And at the end, we have a little, little mangrove. So the first bio indicator were the logs. This is mangrove logs laying all in the bottom of the lake. And this is something we can see when there is low tide. So it's interesting that we see those logs over there. I mean, if there had not been a mangrove at any moment, we wouldn't find the logs over there. The other detail is the organisms we found, which are uh, belonging to these ecosystems and uh, mangroves, and also some others coming from fresh water. From the fresh water, we have the Macrobatium th uh, shrimp, which are the ones that live in the aquatic uh, system substream, but they have to come to the mouth of the river and other systems to be able to uh, lay their eggs. And we also have the Baname shrimp, that the migration is on the other way. They come from the ocean and they need to go to the estuaries to lay their eggs. So that was our first case with the use of the bio indicators to be able to determine the ecosystem in which we were going to work. If you can go to the next slide now, this is another case with mangroves. It's an area in the Caribbean of La Galeta. In this first slide, we see the area that's uh, outlined. Let's move to the next image where we have the area with a series of water channels we did. So just to explain very quickly, this is an area that had been filled out to construct a military basis from the Army of the United States. So to be able to make this basis, they made some landfills and they made a series of canals to dry up the area and be able to build. So we have made a series of canals here to bring uh, water back to this land and leave water here for longer. And what is interesting here, if we go to the next slide, that, that we have some images. There is some fish coming up, yes. And then once we made those uh, canals, we used bioindicators to be able to demonstrate that the canals had been connected with the ecosystem we had around it, that it was not just canals capturing rainwater, but that they had also a key uh, function. And the fish we see there are actually our indicators that we have, a story, a story ecosystem. And we guarantee also that there is an exchange of a species of nutrients and that there is a better condition of health to be able to move on with the restoration of the mangrove. That is another topic. If you can go to the next slide, I'm going to talk now about a project that we're implementing that I'm now in the field in this project. I'm taking some data about this project. This is a project where we use the fish as the power indicators of the quality of water. Now it's kind of difficult because it's difficult for me to, to see the presentation, but if you allow me, I can try to comment. I don't know, Julio, if you can move on with the next slide as I speak. Thank you. Okay. So it's a project that we are developing with the Secretary of Science in Panama. 
in the municipality of Panama City, the Maritime University, the Polytechnical University, and the Wetland International. And we have the support of the sanitation program in Panama, the Ministry of the Environment, and other organizations. And this is a project where we have as a goal or objective to create a tool to determine the state of the quality of the water through the use of aquatic organisms. In this case, this is mainly fish. So, in order to determine this new technique, we are also implementing other indexes such as the forest, uh, the condition of the forest. Then we have also an index for the characterization of the rain systems. Then we have ITCA, which is a water quality index. We also have the index with the use of microinvertebrates to determine the quality of water. And at the same time, we are taking a series of water samples for those that are coliforms, agrochemicals, medications, hydrocarbons, and other components that may be pollutants in the water to make a series of statistical correlations and be able to determine the species that will serve as indicators. So, the support in this project from government institutions is with the intention of training more people in Panama for the use of this technique so that the technique can be used by the public institutions in order to have an immediate response to what might be happening in the water. This project is based on the urban rivers in Panama City. We are working with a river that's in Rio Matasnillo, totally urban. Then there is other two rivers that are semi-urban. One is the Juan Diaz River. Right now I'm very close to the area where the Rio Juan Diaz begins. And then the other one is the Pacora River. So it's uh, three rivers that go through Panama City. So the selection of these rivers is because we are in the uh, area with the greatest demographics in the country where there is more pollutants, which can facilitate the development of the EB model. That's the index, it's a biological index for, uh, for the fish in this case. So with this index, we want the aquatic organisms to be our bioindicators. The bioindicators are very useful. They're not very widely used by all the, the techniques we have, but they can offer an immediate response for the situation we have. Now, Julio, can you tell me what slide we are at? Proposal for um, management, restoration, and rehabilitation measures. Next, now, next slide. Moving to the last slide. Oh, no, that's the last one. Uh huh, yeah. Yeah, that's the last one, which you see the team in the water sampling with some equipment in the, in the back. Okay, yes. Okay, so we use different techniques to be able to determine the different organisms we have in our basins, in our rivers. In that case, that image is a team. They're doing what we call electrofishing. We also have nets. We have a lot of gear for the water. There is sometimes more than 20 people to be able to determine the new techniques and use them in Panama in a general way and hopefully expand it to the region and for other places to also use it. We hope that with this, we can improve in a way the scientific interest for aquatic 
organisms and for the preservation of these organisms in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andres, and my apologies because we were not completely coordinated with your narration, but I think you covered the whole content of the slides. At this moment, I am going to open the space for any specific question that may come up. Remember, you can write that in the chat or you can open your microphone and ask your comment. I just want to say thank you, Andres, for your presentation. Thank you. This is Julio. Thank you, Osvaldo from Honduras. Thank you for your comment. Any comment or question? Well, there are no comments or questions, so we're going to move on with the next presentation by engineer Hugo Parra Tabla that is with us from Mexico in the National Water Commission. Hugo is a civil engineer, graduated from the engineering school from the Autonomous University in Mexico. He has a master's in science and water technology by the Mexican Institute of Water Technology and a specialization in water economy and management from the Metropolitan Autonomous University. He has 25 years of experience in the National Commission of Water, where he has participated in the technical directions of the organizations of the South Pacific, Balsa, San Valle de Mexico basins. He's currently the deputy manager of sector programs for water quality, water quality management, and he's in charge of that management. In addition, he has worked in consulting enterprises for planning, studies, and projects water projects and he's been an external consultant for the Mexican Institute of Water Technology, IMTA, the Geophysics Institute and the Regional Center for Multidisciplinary Research of UNAM. So welcome engineer Paratabla and I open the space here for his presentation. Thank you. Hugo. Hi, thank you Julio and good morning to all of you. My presentation, if we already have it, is called the Water Quality Standards for Wetland Ecosystems, the official Mexican standard for cast systems. I want to clarify that there is no official Mexican standard for karst systems, but it is a request that has been made because of the growth of the Yucatan Peninsula in the last uh, years. The Yucatan Peninsula is in the southeast of our country. It has three states and it is basically a karst platform. Let me see. Can you see the presentation? Yes, I see my presentation. Do you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're they, they, they can they can see the presentation, so we're okay. Okay, so this is a description of the wetlands that we have talked about. We all know the big importance that this has in terms of biological processes for purging and everything. So wetlands are really a very important resource that has been reduced in our country very quickly. And it's actually all over the world, I mean, but in our country, it's been threatened basically by the retention of flows, invasion, the change in land use. It has been reduced and it's uh, becoming a greater issue. Mexico is a country, I've always said it, Mexico is a country of laws. We have a lot of laws. Some of them are very good. Some of them are quite advanced. Some others are not so good. The problem here is that our problem, our serious problem is in terms of en enacting the laws. So I want to frame this in this uh, Mexican case uh, that we really have to uh, also observe international treaties. Then we have the national constitution. And in one of the articles, it says that all natural resources belong to the nation. And this can be concession to private groups. And from there, we have the secondary uh, 
uh, laws also that regulate some particular aspects. The international treaties that Mexico signs would be at the level of the political constitution of the United States. So they're over or prevail over the national standards, but we also have volunteer legislation, national, international. In volunteer legislation, we have the Mexican regulations. Mandatory regulations in Mexico are known as official Mexican uh, standards, but we also have the volunteer standards that are called Mexican uh, standards, and they are basically for the promotion to try to ensure the quality of a lot of the processes and we also have entrepreneurial and social systems. This is within the framework of the legislation and this is a little bit what I was telling you that there are many different laws that can be applied to the wetlands and they have the political constitution of the United Mexican States who have all those articles and then uh, what's important one is the 27th article that in paragraph 5 talks about the, uh, ownership of the waters of the nation. So we also have international agreements, international treaties, the convention with the Ramsar units and so on. And that water is directly focused on the wetlands. We also, and we also have many other rules and legislations related to everything that moves and lives in the wetlands. With regards to national legislation, we have general laws and norms. As you can see, the national, uh, the law for national goods that derives from the ownership of the resources. And there is the national water law that I have highlighted because it's the only one that talks expressly about the wetlands. Then the water, the national oceans law and all these different laws that are related to the work and the protection and management of the wetlands. With regards to Mexican standards for the wetlands, we have 059 that has to do with the native species of Mexico, the wild fauna, the categories of risk and the specifications and the species in risk. So Mexico is a very biodiverse country. So we have a lot to do with the protection of the species. Rule 022 provides the specifications for the preservation, sustainable use and restoration of coastal wetlands in the mangrove areas. When these uh, rules were developed, they miss the opportunity of making this very broad for the different uh, wetlands. It refers specifically to mangroves. Just, just a second, Hugo. Can you kind of go a little bit slowly so that you can help us with the interpretation into English? And I'm in the one that says existing norms. That's the slide I'm at. Okay, so I was... Uh, talking about the last one over there, which is the 159. But let's move to the next slide, the national water law. The national water law has uh, been defining the wetlands. This is a definition of a wetland saying that these are areas of transition between aquatic and terrestrial areas that constitute temporary flooding areas or, or permanent flooding areas subject to the tides and the line that determines the type of vegetation with permanent or seasonal presence. And we have areas that are permanently humid because of the temperate discharge, as you can see here. We're leaving on the side here the marine wetlands. This is because the National Water Law regulates the fresh water, the continental water. So we have here a gap definition of wetlands because the marine wetlands were left out but the reason why is uh, because the national water law really regulates the continental water but not the marine water there is another law for marine water and to contrast we have like uh, the Ramsar convention and the terms of the Ramsar convention 
So we have swamps and uh, different areas that are covered with water, be this natural or artificial, permanent or temporal, in fresh or salty currents where the control of the tide does not exceed the six meters. So right here we are considering the marine wetlands. We have to remember that since it is an international agreement signed by our country, this has the same level as the Constitution, so we have to consider this definition from Ramsar in the Manual for the Management of the Wetlands in our country. I go back to the national water law, and I have to insist that this is the only law in the country that refers expressly to the wetlands and that defines what the wetland is. So the law is a single article talking about the wetlands, but it provides what the water authority has to do. In this case, it's the National Water Commission for the preservation of the wetlands that are affected by these uh, regime for the national waters. In other words, we talk about the superficial water, we have to about the underwater. So it's five areas. The first one is to limit and keep the inventory of the wetlands. There is a first national inventory of the wetlands. It was uh, implemented in a scale to one to 150,000, everything through a cartographic means. Now we are making a second effort, which is to have this uh, outlining of the wetlands in a scale of one to 50,000, which of course implies a lot of effort. We have 6,000, more than 6,300 wetlands recognized, and that implies 5% of the territory of the country. Mexico is a country that is not small. We have 2 million square kilometers. So we're close to 100,000 square kilometers of wetlands. So keeping them, maintaining them represents a very important challenge for the capacities that we currently have in the commission. The second aspect here is to promote under the terms of the present law and its regulations, the National Water Reserves or Ecological Reserves. There is an official norm in Mexico, which is 159, that has um, was recently elaborated and published, even less time being enacted. But th what this standard does is to provide ecological uh, uh, elements, not as a percentage of the runoff, but something that tends to the vital needs of the rivers of the of the different basins and well that includes the wetlands this has been a great progress in our country we have at uh, the national level the consideration of these there are some basins in the southeast where we consider up to 80 percent of the volume the third part here is uh, the one that refers more to what we are discussing here is to propose official Mexican standards to preserve, protect, and restore wetlands, the natural waters that feed them, and the aquatic and hydrological ecosystems that are part of them. And now I'm going to go back to this in a second. Let me just move to the fourth and fifth just to mention them all for you to understand. What's the vision from this uh, law? The fourth one is to promote and carry out necessary actions to rehabilitate and restore wetlands as to establish the natural environmental protection perimeter of the wetland. What we have done in this one is to define guidelines that allow us to define that environment because if we do not define up to which point the wetland is and how much of the territory used by the wetland or occupied by the wetland can be claimed or protected with the national water law, we are in a serious uh, issue so far. The national inventory was done at the cartographic level and a scale one to 250,000, so it's still too big. So the National Institute of Statistics and Geography is trying to get to another scale. They made a great effort and they're trying to do it to in one to 50,000. So we are now working on the Ramsar wetlands. Mexico has 142 Ramsar wetlands that are recognized. We are now working in the northern border and the southern border. We still have the, the central part of the country to cover, but we're moving forward. And the last one, which is to grant permit 
seems to be contradictory or polemic, but this is very important to drain the land in wetlands. Uh, so as I know, the National Water Commission has uh, not granted a, a single permit to drain wetlands. However, it's been mentioned here, some of them are being dried up because of the bad use or, or uh, bad management of the currents and so on. So these are some of the norms. I have the norms on protection, quality, and quantity. Protection, this is what I had mentioned, but it's getting uh, short. With regards to quality, we have norm 0196 that provides the maximum allowances for contaminants in the discharges of wastewater. I want to highlight here that this is standard of 25 years. It has been exceeded by the reality. In terms of quantity, we have 011, which is the conservation of our resources, water resources that is used to grant permits. And the idea is uh, not to get to the levels of over-exploitation. Then 014, this is a requirement. So 014 and 015 are important in this uh, talk because the karst system or the karst system has been used to receive in the waste of water. So it's a kind of recharge. It's kind of messed up, but with inadequate quality. And the 159 that I mentioned, it establishes the procedures for the determination of the ecological flow in hydrological basins. So the point in this one is that it only refers to some particular basins and the Yucatan Peninsula is the a basin without the rivers so because it is a peninsula. So you can see here the Yucatan Peninsula. In this uh, other slide, there are three states. We have Campeche, then we have Yucatan, and we have Campeche, Yucatan, and Quintana Roo. Those are the three states. We have 430 wetlands, but if you see, with the exception of the area of Campeche in the southwest of the peninsula where there are rivers, most of the territory has no rivers. The wetlands are really in the coast. And this is because of the dynamic of the underground water that persists in the peninsula. So I'm going to show you in this other slide two models. The first one is from the National Water Commission. It's an old one, and it's very simple. This here is a simple model because it is based on the fact that logically water goes from top to bottom, and the central part of the Yucatan Peninsula is the highest area. When I say the highest area, I'm just talking about 200, 250 meters above sea level. So the Yucatan Peninsula is just like a table. It has no slopes. So this is the simplified model that has been used. And in the right, we have a more complex model, which is an assembly of different studies that have been made for many years. Um, the complexity is uh, more difficult to approach. And the wetlands, as I said, are really in the coast. So this is when we start facing some problems to define how they are being fed. They all get underground water, but where's the underground water coming from? I mean, where can human activities affect the whole area, the wetlands, not just in the amount of water that they are receiving, but also the quality. This is here a chart of the Yucatan uh, peninsula, it is a karst uh, medium. There's no rivers. There is a very low permeability, but a high secondary permeability. And then the water dissolves the karst systems. And we have what we call the cenotes here in Mexico. As you see here in the right hand, we have a scheme where the wetlands come out. 
They are fed by underground water, but this is a mix of marine water with the salt water. That is why we have so much mangrove in the coastal area of the Yucatan Peninsula. The problem here is the activities that are developed in the territory. As you can see, it is a rock that is difficult to work on. It's complicated to do water capturing system for wastewater. So we have serious problems because the high cost implies that there are no sufficient systems for the collection of sewage and there is a lot of dispersed discharge. And once the water is used, when we can treat it, we, ha we have to power directly to the aquifer or disperse it in the surface and hope that part of it evaporates and other goes filter through the different cracks. And definitely the contamination goes directly to the aquifer. This is an area that is complex to approach. And we have a serious problem. This here, I don't know, we don't have I any idea of how many cenotes we have at the Yucatan Peninsula. This other image, we have some of them that are recognized, but there are others that we don't have. So we don't really have an idea of how many of these cenotes we have in the peninsula. Although we have this beautiful uh, images we have on the right, these are also windows through which lots of things come in. The cenotes in Mexico, are used to supply, to take water from there. Others are used to discharge wastewater. There are some that discharge solid waste directly, but they're also used with tourist purposes. So they are exposed to great pressure, a serious problem for the filtration of contaminants. And that's the water that is really flowing through the aquifer. And the implication is that, well, the flow is through the caverns of underground rivers that have random directions, and we do not have specific mapping. They're developing some mapping, especially in Quintana Roo. They have mapped about 700 kilometers or something like that, but that's much greater. So we have an issue here, not just of controlling the quality that can come in, but also to know where these contaminants are moving. So we have here a problem that is very serious. So saying that in our country, they're developing this uh, mapping and uh, there has been a lot of demographic growth in the peninsula in the area of Campeche. Everything is growing a lot in agricultural activities, but they're using a lot of agrochemicals that had been filtered in the aquifer. In Yucatan, the growth is more directed to the agricultural and livestock area. We now have an issue with the installation of some uh, pig plants that are a serious problem for the whole situation. And it's not just the waste, but also that there's been changes in the subsoil, there's been changes in the jungle, and this brings serious problems because there is a lot of contaminants coming into the aquifer that used to be contained, and now they're in the process of digestion or transformation. And now they're coming directly. And the western part, which is the eastern part, which is Quintana Roo, maybe you know Cancun, or you may know about Cancun. This is one of the uh, most uh, commonly visited tourist sites in the world. And they're receiving many millions per year. This last year, we got less than normal, but there are lots of visitors per year. And that's a little piece in the coast that has some pressure over there because of the use of the water and the generation of waste, not just in water, but also there's a, we have seen solid waste and it's an excessive use of, uh, of the territory and that has caused uh, serious problems. So. When you're going to develop standard, you have to do or you have to ask these questions here to, I mean, why regulating? Well, it seems obvious we want to regulate to preserve the environment. So what do you want to, to preserve? Air, all the environment part of it, then what to regulate? And then who to regulate? Who do we regulate? Do we regulate the farmers that are using the agrochemicals in excess that are 
uh, cut in the jungle to uh, plant palm oil and then do you regulate the producers? Do you regulate the tourists? Well, that's logical is to regulate everyone. But in this case, you cannot really uh, regulate everyone. You, there are indigenous uh, locations that have some uses and customs, and they also have some customs that may affect the environment. In general, they go uh, in agreement with the environment, but there are some other customs that they may have that can affect the environment. So the, who to regulate is a good question. Now, who regulates? Again, that's another question. The National Water Commission regulates the water, but this is a problem of the territory at the end. The water is really a problem that has to do with territory management, and the wetlands are like at the end of the chain. So this is a good indicator to know how the basin has been managed. It's a very good result. Now, who participates in the elaboration? Who had to invite a Mexican? The Mexican legislation forces us to invite those that are regulated because. It, it's kind of strange because you tend to be in like a judge and a party, right? But that's uh, the importance of working with the native, uh, the natives in the area. We have to take them into account, but we also have to take into account the farmers, the tourism sector, the industrial sector. So we have to get them involved. And then we come to a serious problem, which is who verifies the compliance with the standard, because since it has so many perspectives, there is a, there would be a lot of entities in the country that would have to regulate or verify compliance, and there is a legal administrative issue that's quite complex. So when increasing or when elaborating this standard, we should not forget that uh, you always have to be implementable. If the standard is more costly than, the, than solving the problems that it causes, then it won't be applied. Evidently, fixing problems in an area as fragile as the Yucatan Peninsula is more expensive than any standard. And you have to demonstrate that, and that implies money, efforts, and a lot of fights. It has to be fair because of what I was saying. Who are you going to apply this to? Those inland or those in the coast? Because at the end, they're the last ones. Then do you see incentives to look for the best solutions to the problem? There are many ways of facing the problems. It is not just the government part, the administrative part, or the regulatory part. There are many ways of doing this, but it has to be achievable using the best uh, technologies available. In Mexico, they set some limits for the quality of the water that were so strict that there was no way of measuring them. The concentrations that they tried to put in the limits were so low that there was no technology to do this. So whatever standard is set has to be achievable, has to be supervisable. This means that the authorities should have a capacity to verify the compliance and this is where we have some issues. There should be enough time, sufficient time for the elaboration because it is urgent. In Mexico, we say that let's go slowly because we're in a rush, right? We really have to be, we have to take the time. We have to consider all the different areas of the problem, all the areas that are regulated and all the consequences of moving on without regulations taking also the environmental uh, liabilities that somebody will pay, and I think it's at a short, uh, very short time. We should not lose sight that with regards to the wetlands, that the majority of the areas that they occupy are not part of the territorial reserves and are not protected. Our country has that big problem. We have very few protected areas, very few territorial reserves, so the wetlands are in some areas that have different uh, particularities in terms of ownership. There may be uh, under protection, they may belong to the federal government, the state government, the municipal government, but they can also be private, they can be, uh, they can belong to a society. So there may be a lot of owners for the land. So we have to work with all of them for them to understand why the wetlands have to be preserved. But we have to offer a different alternative for them to also have a productive life and for them to be able to live reasonably. They require water in a specific uh, 
time and everything. So this becomes complicated because we can measure the water of a river without problem. We can measure the quality. We can measure the viability through time. But we cannot do this in the underground water. It is more complicated to do it, especially in this means where it is so complicated to know what is the direction of the water. So we have a serious issue here. We can use the wetlands because the land occupied by the alternative use has great economic value. The use of the wetlands is very productive, and particularly in the area of Quintana Roo, the alternative use with international tourism, and it's complicated to compete against that. So they are using a lot of very fragile areas in the peninsula. And we should not lose sight of these uh, car systems. It's a complex and fragile environment, as I've been noticed, noting here. And the states of the Yucatan Peninsula have a diverse economic growth orientation. So we have to focus on that economic orientation and set rules to modulate each of these growth schemes. And another very important part of the Yucatan Peninsula is that we do not know how many cenotes there are or what uh, they're used. As I said, they can use it to extract water, to receive wastewater, to receive solid waste for tourist use. And among others, right, there is a scientific use for research that is very important too. And these cenotes are not defined in the national water law. They do not adjust to what a wetland is, to what an underground work is. So they're kind of on the air, right? And well, I just have to say thank you very much for your attention, for your patience. I think I took longer than my previous colleagues. But again, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Hugo. That was a very good presentation, especially the legal framework and its complexity in Mexico for the cenotes and the wastewater. If there is any specific question for Engineer Parra that we can solve at this moment, so you can write it on the chat or open the microphone and ask a question. Yes, Osvaldo. Osvaldo Munguia. Yes, dear Ugo, thank you very much for that presentation. For me, it has had very innovative things. I had barely heard about the cenotes, but I hadn't had the chance of learning so much as uh, we have had in the presentation that without a doubt i know it has been summarized but it has given us a very nice uh, view perspective in that sense i would like to ask if in the cenotes there is also aquatic biodiversity and what type approximately we can think about, I don't know, finding some specific species. I don't know. Is it fresh water or is it a mix of fresh water and salt water? What local population lives near the cenotes? Although we are clear that you do not know exactly how many cenotes there are. Uh, and that's actually very interesting. It's interesting to have so many of them. Also, what is the area of Yucatan? Approximately and in average is uh, if uh, like the valley or wetland or cenotes, these things. I thought it was very important. I 
I thought it was very important to see the this emphasis that the standard has to be uh, achievable because if the standards are not achievable, then we're not doing anything. And in addition to achievable, I would like to know if you're considering that these standards should also be like friendly in the sense of uh, having benefits for people and not just restrictions. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you actually very much for your questions. And well, you made it complicated to me because it's a lot of questions with very precise data, but I'm going to try to go over that. These cenotes, especially in the coastal areas, that's a very clear uh, mix between freshwater and seawater. There is a reflux between the continental systems and the non-continental systems towards the center of the territory. The salt water is uh, reduced, but in in there's some people that considers that sea uh, that salt water goes from the Caribbean uh, Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico as if there was a continuous of marine water underlying the freshwater area, but it's it's proven that even 70, 80 kilometers inland, there is this interface between freshwater and salt water. So this creates a diversity of species living in the cenotes of all types, like algae and bacteria, stromophilos. There is a very interesting documentary that's quite old, and it's called The Caves of the Dormant uh, Sharks. I don't know if you've seen it. There's some uh, caves in the karst environment in Yucatan where the sharks go in and sleep. You know that sharks have to swim all the time to be able to breathe. To breathe. But because of the currents over there, there are sharks. Yes, they have seen some crocodiles also. So there is a whole uh, exchange of species uh, that's very interesting. So the the population of the Yucatan Peninsula is about 3 million inhabitants. But we have two important concentrations in Merida in the state of Yucatan that has over a million inhabitants and Cancun that has 700,000 inhabitants and is growing at a very accelerated pace precisely because of the tourist attraction. It is developing quite a lot and uh, Cancun started in the north of the state and now it's going all the way to Turun. Turun is an archaeological area that has beautiful landscapes where we have some uh, Mayan archaeological ruins and you have the coast. So all that is very, very attractive and has been developed. So the state of Quintana Roo in 75, when Cancun started to develop, had 50,000 inhabitants and now it's about 1,200,000. So we're facing that aspect too. How many of them live around the cenotes? Well, the problem is that they are so widely distributed that it's very complex to know how many people live there. But around the cenotes, I mean, the cenotes are within the cities themselves, but they're also widely disseminated throughout the territory. So they are subject to urban pressures and also rural pressures in the rural environment. They're usually used for uh, or in a more sustainable way because it's usually to cover the water needs for the population. And there are small populations, Mayan populations. So the pressure is not so big there, but with the distribution of the flow, they can be very respectful to the cenotes, but the contamination comes from upstream. What percentage in the area? Well, in a percentual perspective, I would say that wetlands are about 1% of the territory precisely because they are kind of in 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 just the coast, you know, in the area of Campeche, which is like the transition between the karst environment and other environments where we already have rivers. 
So there is a different water cycle, it's superficial. So they would be subject to the processes of floodings and so on. So that's the largest area. But in percent, I don't have an exact data. Uh, I wouldn't know what percentage is represented by these uh, wetlands. So I hope that I covered all your questions very quickly and that I could have answered your questions well. If not, you will also have my information and we can exchange information in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ugo. That has been a very good uh, clarification. I'm sure we're going to be in touch via email also. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ugo. Thank you, Osvaldo. We have a question. If we can share standard 14, says here. So I don't know. We can find the link. Uh, to to uh, detail that yes yes I will I will send you I will send you the links or, or I can send you the standards for you to also have access to the national inventory of the wetlands and also the national water law because we have made a big effort in Mexico yeah I, I can share that Okay, thank you, Ugo. I think that in order to move on with the program, we're going to take a five-minute break just to stretch a little bit. Don't leave. It's just five minutes. And I also invite you to take this time and ask some questions in the chat for our plenary and see how we can focus this. Okay, let's think precisely about those challenges and opportunities that we have to integrate the approaches of water resources management or the management of the water and sanitation systems and ecosystem management. We're very interested also in you sharing the experiences from your countries and uh, the speakers have given us some hints of what they face in their own context. But if you want, I'm going to put the clock here for five minutes and I invite you to put your questions in the chat and we'll come back at 30 minutes past the hour with the plenary discussion. And there was a question in the English chat that is going to be asked during the plenary. And we also invite the participants in the English channel to write your questions in the chat and our colleague TZN will send it to us. Thank you.
Thank you again, colleagues. We're back here. We're going to move now to our plenary discussion where we have invited you to ask your questions in chats. Soon we will be sharing the standard 14 as was requested. First, I wanted to verify it was to have Osvaldo, Hugo and Andres. Hugo is there. Thank you, Hugo. Yes, Osvaldo is there and Andres. OK, I think we lost Andres because he was actually in the field. He said he was doing some field work, doing some biomonitoring. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Osvaldo, Osvaldo Sayer, thank you. Okay, so if there is any, we do have a question that's still pending from the English uh, channel. There was a question from Daryl that I think was uh, basically for Andres, but maybe Hugo or Dr. Hordan can help us answer. And it is about the mangrove die-off. I think this uh, refers to the Panama Bay and the area of the city of Osvaldo, so maybe you can help us. It says, how much can this be related to bad water quality or if it is more related to other factors such as hydrology uh, alteration or changes in land use? Yes, uh, thank you very much. That is a very interesting question. The phenomenon for mangrove die-off has been taking place in several places of Panama, not just in Panama Bay, but also in several other places in the Pacific, both the American Pacific as well as Asia. As the question is coming from the Caribbean, I am very curious. And maybe uh, we see, yes, there are still some sites in the area. It's a complex issue. Here in Panama, there is a very diverse uh, research group that is trying, has been trying to understand what is actually happening and their different hypotheses. So we talk about climatic aspects like El Nino phenomenon that has to do with climate change. And then one of the hypotheses that becomes more important is that it is precisely related to the flows, hydrology flows. And this is actually one of the uh, suggestions of the person that sent the question. So that is why this is very essential. This is an essential topic, and this is where we can find a space to accommodate some constructed wetlands that improve the ecosystem part, especially for the mangroves, with the uh, treatment of water. But certainly one of the possibilities that has become very credible is that it actually has to do with hydrology flows. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. Yeah, actually, it depends on the context. So there are factors that can influence more or less on the local biodiversity. And well, of course, we also have the case of the cenotes that also being a type of wetland, it, they have a very different dynamic. So far, I don't see any other questions. So I am going to ask a couple of questions to the experts to motivate the discussion. I am going to begin with Hugo. You talked about the challenges in the establishment of these standards that although they have been developed by an institution, at the moment of really developing them and enacting them, this requires 
and intersector as well as interinstitutional coordination. Can you tell us a little bit about how Mexico tries to solve this uh, complexity of coordination? Sure. And thank you for the question. As I was saying, Mexico is a country of laws. So we have a law that has been modified recently, which is metrology and normalization. It's now called the law for the quality of infrastructure. And it provides the basis on how to regulate. So to be able to regulate, there has to be an initiative could be from the government or from a civil association, from some industrial associations. I mean, the general public, the academia, you can get an initiative for a law from any of those. And it is put to the consideration of the government area that has to do with the specific topic and they start going through some discussion. Once it is discussed, once you see that it is not contrary to other standards or other laws, and then it is subject to public uh, discussion where all stakeholders can participate. So there is a process of discussion they make the necessary modifications and once an agreement is reached in this debate tables then it's put up in the sectoral commission that the is in charge of the standard it is then published in the official journal for the federation which is an official uh, channel to do this and then it is subject to public consultation for a period where we receive questions, doubts, suggestions for incorporations, objections, and then it is then discussed again. All those uh, questions are answered and those that are admissible are incorporated to the standards. Those that are not admissible and are uh, justify why that was not approved. And once it goes through all this process, then there is like the statement of the uh, administrative impact to demonstrate what I was saying, that the application is economically positive, that the application of these uh, regulation is not going to be more expensive than the problem it is solving, so that is the process. Once this uh, finishes and you say, okay, it is economically viable, then it is published and we start applying. They usually have a process for application. And we say that it is going to be applied as of a whatever date. So the first one is to write the objective of the standard who is, is uh, aim to and who's going to verify the compliance. So that is the process for the standards in the country. Thank you very much, Hugo. I think that this is a very interesting approach in Mexico because really you are asking all the relevant questions in the process to make sure or to at least support a little bit more of the viability of the norm and the or the standard and the eventual implementation and of course we should not forget as you have mentioned not just the economic aspect but also some technical aspects like who is going to monitor what are the capacities to do the monitoring where is the information registered who evaluates that information all that that requires some uh, you know structuring for the implementation. I wanted to invite the participants in case anybody wanted to share the experience about how you know, these uh, standards are developed in the countries or what gaps you may have that may require some strengthening, thinking precisely about some of the aspects of this uh, chain that can be reinforced through our academy. So if anybody wants to share the case, any case or any situation, let's see who wants to say something.
or let's see if anybody from the English speaking channel wants to say something. If you want to say something, just go ahead. You can open your microphone and ask. Um, hello, good day. Um, this is Daryl from Trinidad. Um, hello, are you here? Go, go ahead, Daryl. Yes, um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I would like to share um, um, my experience in, Trin in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of management of water quality and the process. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have like an overriding national environmental po policy like for protection of the environment. Um, we have the, the, tr the, trend, the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards, which is um, the body that will um, develop standards. And we have the Environmental Management Authority, which is the enforcing agency for those standards. Like for example, we have, for example, standards for water pollution rules, and recently there was um, a standard for ambient water quality. However, the problem is um, also enforcement in terms of having the necessary human capacity to manage um, these activities in terms of doing independent check and balance based on information and data submitted like from, com from companies who are being monitored by the agency. So it's a very complex process and the setting of standards is, is a very complex one in the sense that when a standard is developed, um, it is defined by um, a water quality use. Like for example, if you are de um, de um, generating a standard for, for the mangrove environment, is it that the aquatic organisms that you are targeting for ecosystem health or is it that a maximum uh, pollutant loading in the area, or is it related to the mangrove themselves, of which mangrove can can tolerate, like for example, a high level of nutrients. And so overall, um, in my view, the the issue of um, collaboration with different organizations in terms of lessons learned is is a good way. And in Trent and Tobago, the IME is the regional activity center for the land based sources of um, pollution protocol for the English speaking countries. And presently, there is a development of a nutrient management strategy, which would outline um, activities in terms of reducing nutrient pollution. So I, I would just like to share this. So thank you all very much. And that's a very interesting webinar. Th th thanks so much for all the presenters. Thank you, Daryl. We see that the case of Trinidad has, you know, this kind of institutional and legal structure. But of course, as, as in many other cases, you also have to reinforce the part of implementation or enactment of those laws. So once again, we're talking about the need of filling these gaps, everything that's implied in the development of regulations, the coordination of sectors, the, the topic that Ugo has also mentioned about consultation processes that should take into consideration all the relevant sectors and stakeholders. And we always have to think about the viability and the sustainability of the implementation of this uh, measurement. So these uh, topics actually have to do also with the financial part. And these are things that we are going to be approaching at the Crew Plus Academy. So we invite you to be kind of attentive to the coming webinars. I wanted to make a question for Osvaldo here. And this is related to the topic of which is the main challenge it to it, what's the main challenge in the future to really analyze the value of the ecosystem services provided by the wetlands in integral water resource management and also water and sanitation i want to know if in practice 
we still have that division. You talked a lot about the urban environments and how they present an opportunity to kind of link with other entities. But what other measures can we take to promote this integration of the different approaches? Yes, thank you very much, Julio. And there is precisely a question about experiences in Latin America. And I'm going to try to send uh, the link to one of the articles that make kind of a summary of the experiences in several of the countries. This is very general, but at least it serves as an index. So based on this literature review, a fundamental part of all this is how we re-educate or how we retrain our professionals in Latin America and the Caribbean for them to think about these possibilities. Something that attracted my attention a lot is that a lot of knowledge has been generated because it is a very technical topic on how the designs are made, the advantages of different types of designs and the disadvantages of those designs for water treatment in the constructor, uh, constructed wetlands. A lot of the information was coming from Europe, some of the information from Asia. We think that our professionals in Latin America and the Caribbean, they have all the capacity to also generate knowledge and to implement what has been done in other areas. But we also have higher education institutions that have not made a transition and we do not have professional environmental engineers trained in these technologies, then they're not going to be implemented. So one of the main challenges is to be able to a change a little bit of the programming we have. I mean, it's not that we see like the wastewater treatment plant totally separate from the wetland. No, the idea is to train a key group of professionals in these technologies that could be the critical mass that will have an impact in the different countries of the region. Thank you, Osvaldo. You're actually highlighting a very important aspect of the part of the contribution of the academic sector and the professional preparation because we also have to consider how we're going to be moving on on the one hand with the policies and the regulations and also the capacities from the supply and the demand of the or from the users of the water sector because uh, they are, yes, subjects to the regulations, but they also develop their own capacities to comply with the expectations from uh, the state as a regulator. So, Ugo, I don't know if you have anything to add on how this uh, dynamic is developed. In the case of Mexico, if the productive sectors or water users also have this uh, openness to adapt uh, to more stringent standards? Well, it is always complex. Nobody likes to have uh, rules uh, set up, and especially if they can affect our pockets. As I was mentioning about the standard 01 that regulates the discharges in Mexico since 1996. So by law in Mexico, we have to update that every five years. This one has not been updated basically because of the resistance to having more stringent standards. This standard, the idea was to be like a basic standard with the idea that by 2010, we could be covering the whole country with that standard. It has not been the case. And now we have the modification of the standard that becomes even more strict. So. It is very complex to have people just accept these changes. So that is why we sometimes have to get into the economic terms. I think that the universal language has to do with money, whatever currency it is. But that's a universal language. I mean, if, if we do not set uh, costs to to environment and things like that it's going to be very complicated to raise awareness in mexico we have insisted a lot as i was saying mexico is a country of laws and what's difficult for us is to comply the laws so there's always a lot of resistance to the standards especially when the idea or when we are increasing restrictions 
and this has a cost because normally we try to just focus on liabilities. If we do not uh, internalize those costs, uh, then those creating contamination will not be aware of this. But we have to move forward. We have to raise awareness. And well, if that does not work, then we need to have laws and regulations that are applied and that have consequences. Because if there are no consequences, then people will not be aware. Well, thank you, Hugo. I think that that is actually a very good comment to uh, start closing. As uh, you mentioned, you mentioned how we got to find the balance between the incentives and the requirement of uh, complying with the standards, not just think about the costs, but also think about investment, something that can be uh, retributed to ensure the supply of water. So in that sense, I would like to close by thanking our three speakers of the day. Andres had to uh, leave. He had to go to the field. And you will have the contacts over there uh, for any Further question, we also recorded the presentation to put it in the academy. And I would, I would also like to close by making this brief evaluation that our colleague Susana, I think, is going to uh, put in the chat. There is a survey in the chat. So you can fill it out whenever you want, but hopefully you can do it right away now that you have your memory uh, fresh. And this is going to help us plan our next sessions, topics that uh, you may be interested on and so on, as well as what aspects we can improve. Uh, we This is our first webinar. And I just want to thank you all for your participation. We also leave our contacts to receive other later uh, input if that is not yet reflected in the evaluation. And well, just to say thank you to all of you. And once again, thank you for your participation. Have a great day. And we'll be waiting for you in our next webinar that it's going to be on March the 8th. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, too. The same. Thanks. Bye.